Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you in Sunday school this morning. I'm going to ask you, if you will, to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Luke, chapter number 15. Luke 15. And uh, go ahead and give you a little preface before we get into what we're going to study this morning. I know that this particular passage, for instance, John 3.16 is probably the most well-known verse out of the Bible. There are some scriptures in the Bible that are pretty well known. And what we're going to read today is a scripture that is pretty well known. In, in the church environment, everyone has heard this scripture. Everyone has heard probably, I don't know, hundreds of messages out of this one particular scripture. And I know a lot of times that when we um, have a preacher tell us to turn to a particular passage. For instance, if somebody said turn to the book of Jonah, uh, you might think to yourself, how many, <laughs> how many different times can we hear about Jonah and the whale? And how many different ways can somebody present it to us? And so on and so forth. And Brother Tab, uh, when I was doing some Bible college studies, Brother Tab always said that uh, we might be able to look at a particular verse and we might be able to pick two or three things out of it and glean two or three different things but that the Lord could take that same verse and literally show us hundreds of things out of that same verse. Because depending on where you are in your Christian walk, you will be ready in different ways to receive the Word of God. Uh, if you get in here as a new Christian, the Lord is going to open up some things to you, but He's going to keep you on the milk of the Word of God for a little while. He won't move you to the meat until you're ready for it. And so that's why you want to continually read the Bible. That's why you want to continually hear... Uh, different messages preached. The, the title of the Sunday school lesson this morning is Simple but Odd. Rinse and Repeat. Anybody ever read your shampoo bottle? Shampoo bottle tells you to take it, apply it, lather it, wash it, scrub it. Then it says rinse and repeat. And a lot of times that's what we need to do with the Bible. We need to rinse and repeat. In other words, when we've heard a particular passage, we've heard it preached, we've heard it taught, we, we know what we were supposed to glean from at that particular time, we need to rinse and we need to repeat every once in a while. We need to go back, we need to look at it, we need to glean from it. And, you know, one of the things that uh, has been important to me in the ministry is uh, the Lord certainly called me to preach. And I have no problem rearing back and preaching the Word of God. But the Lord also called me to teach. And it's always been important for me in my ministry not just to preach to people, but also to teach. And when it comes to Sunday school, I want to teach you things out of the Bible, but I also have always had a pretty high priority on teaching people how to study the Bible. Okay? And to me, this whole idea of rinse and repeat is very important. You want to study a particular passage, you want to let it sink in and meditate on it. You want to go back. You want to read it again and study it. And part of what we're going to do today is we're going to walk through this particular Scripture and we are going to rinse and repeat this particular Scripture and uh, look at it a little bit differently, I hope, than you've seen it before. But let's look in verse number 11 of chapter 15. The Bible says, And he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the young son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he, <clears throat> and when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son." Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. 
But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. We'll stop right there and we'll pick up here in just a little bit, but let's just have a word of prayer real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord. We're always excited to be able to come into the house of God and open up the Word of God. Lord, we're always excited as to what you may show us. And Lord, certainly during Sunday school, you have a way of showing us things that maybe we haven't seen before. Lord, showing us things in a different direction. And I pray that today, Lord, you would accomplish uh, what you desire. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see things uh, from a different vantage point. And Lord, that you would help them or help us to apply those things to our lives. Lord, make whatever changes need to be made. And Lord, help us to grow and get closer to you in our walk. Lord, that is our goal in each and every week, is just to be closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to lift you up high. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> On the surface, we could all quote this scripture by heart. If uh, we were to say, hey, do you remember the story of the prodigal son? Everybody would say, oh yeah, Brother Steve, I remember what happened. Father had two sons. The younger son came and said, Father, uh, divide up your, your living to, to me. I want to go out and kind of live my own life. And so the father did that. And the young man took uh, his portion and he went out and began to live his own life the way that he chose to live it. But he wasted it in his riotous living and that kind of thing and found himself in a bad situation, so much so that he had to uh, pretty much sell himself out to someone else. He found himself out feeding swine, and he was so hungry and, and, and without anything that he would have gladly partaken of the same slop and the same food that he was feeding of the swine. And while he was doing that, he got to thinking about what it was like back at the father's house and how good that he had it there. He conceived a plan in his, in his mind that if he could just get back down to the Father's house and even if he could go back in as a servant like he was right now, that it would be better to be a servant in his Father's house than it would to, be, to stay where he was at that particular time. So he gets up and, and he goes back to the Father's house and he rehearses you know, what he's going to say to his father when he gets back there. and He's not going to even want to be entered back in as his son, but just as a servant. And as he gets close to where he needs to be, the father sees him afar off and he runs and he throws his arms around him and he hugs him and kisses him and just happy to see him again. And he won't even hear about him coming in as a servant. He wants him to come back in as a son. And we know he kills the fatted calf. We know that he throws a, a party, puts on him a robe and a ring and so on and so forth. And we know that the story ends up with a, a, a pretty happy father knowing that his son is uh, alive, knowing that his son is back uh, in the family fold all over again. And we even can go on in the part that we didn't read and know that while all this was going on, that the elder son was outside seeing what was going on. He asked one of the servants what in the world's going on in there. And she tells him, hey, your brother's back. And your dad said, let's have a party and let's have a celebration that he's back. And he gets kind of stubbed up on things and he gets his feelings hurt because he had been there the entire time and never once has his father thrown him a party and let him make merry with all his friends. And he's the one been out there doing all the hard work. He's been the one stuck by the father. He's been the one, you know, that was always faithful. And why in the world would this brother get the party and get the, you know, the celebration? Why wouldn't he get it? And of course, after that, you know, the father desiring that his other son would be in there celebrating with him, he goes out and begins to question and see what's wrong. And, and the son tells him, and and then he gives him some, some pretty solid truth that basically all along everything that the father had belonged to him. It was his. You know, he, he always had it, could have done with him what he wanted to. Uh, it was there for him to use and to draw strength from and be encouraged by. But the son had never seen it quite that way before. So, you know, we have a kind of a, a general idea about this particular passage. And we look at this father of him being representative of the Lord and how he will uh, readily accept us back if we've been out a prodigal in the world. And I certainly could raise my hand today and tell you that that's absolutely true uh, because there was a time in my early years that I walked away from the Lord and walked away from the house of God, got really involved in the things of the world, making money and becoming worldly successful, finding a wife, starting a family, trying to get all the things that I thought were going to be important to me. You know, a big house, nice cars, nice things, and all that kind of stuff. And still, 
still ended up feeling like this uh, uh, fellow did here, that it would be better just to be back where I was before and have the joy and the peace than to have all the belongings that I had at this particular point. And the Lord showed me right there very clearly, you just need to get back to where you once left. And I did that very quickly. And the Lord received me and took me right back into the fold. And here I am today, glad that I made that first step to go back to the Father's house. But where this whole idea of rinse and repeat comes is we have studied this Scripture and studied this Scripture and quite honestly we think that we have looked at it from every vantage point. We think that we have drawn from it in every way. But if you live any amount of time in this life, you will find out that there's always a new way of looking at something. You're always going to look at it from a, a different vantage point. And God is always able of showing you something new. If not, why read through the Bible a second time? I mean, I, I'm not a good reader. And by saying I'm not a good reader, it doesn't mean I can't read. I can read. I just don't like to read that much. You won't find me sitting around reading a magazine. You won't find me sitting around reading... Uh, you know, some novel of some sort. Uh, matter of fact, you give me a book that thick, it intimidates me pretty good, and, and I don't even open it up. Are you with me? Now, when somebody gives me a book, I'll open it up and look at the words, and if the words are about that big, and you know the pages aren't that many, I'll read through it. But I'm just not a good reader. I don't enjoy it. And many times there have been people who give me a book and say, hey, we want you to read this. And I'll tell them, I'll do my best to read it. But honestly, there's only one book I read, and that's the Bible. Because I just am not uh, a, a good reader. But you know, uh, the books that I have read, I read them once and I put them away. I've already read it. I've already known what's going on. Now when I watch a movie, if I like the movie, I may watch it multiple times. You know, I can turn a movie on and still walk around the house and do things. And because I've seen the movie before, I know where I'm at. I know what's going on. Uh, but every once in a while, I'll say, "Huh, you know, I didn't see that the other day when I was watching the movie or whatever. So you learn something new. But, you know, the Bible, we are to open it up daily. We are to read it regularly. You know, it wouldn't be uncommon and, uh, uh, you know, for us to, to, to have a message out of this Scripture this morning and come back tonight and somebody preach out of the same Scripture. That wouldn't be uncommon at all. Matter of fact, I've seen God do that uh, many times. But at the same time, if God thinks it's important enough for us to hear twice in one day, there's probably something there that He wants us to really pay attention to and some things He wants us to see. And if He wants us to go back through the Bible and continue to read and continue to study, He wants to build upon the foundation that He's given us. And each time we go through there, He's doing just that. He's building on the foundation. He's just putting more uh, on us. He's helping us to understand things better. And so every once in a while, we just need to rinse and repeat. Now, I want it this morning to try to look at things the way that I do sometimes. And I've tried to explain to you how I study the Bible. And if I was to break this thing apart, like I kind of want to this morning, the first thing I would do is I would read it and get the general idea of what's going on. And I think we have a good understanding there. But then I would go back and I would take the characters that we find in this particular passage and I would try to look at things from their uh, vantage point from where they are. Obviously we can break it apart and we know right away that there is the father. We know there is the prodigal son. We know there is the elder son. There's at least three different ways we can look at it. If you really want to go crazy, you can look at it from the standpoint of the fellow who who uh, is responsible for giving the, the prodigal son, you know, the, the job down there with the swine. You can look at it from there if you really get involved in what's going on here. There's some different ways that you can look at it from those that may look on from a family friendship standpoint because we don't always see that, but I, there were family friends that watched on and saw all of this going on. How many of you would say that you know someone that would fit in line with the prodigal son? Yeah. How many of you would know somebody that would fit in line with the father and the prodigal son? Absolutely, we know that. And then the elder son. I don't think we think about that a lot 
Maybe that's a place that if you read something and you say, huh, I've thought about it from the standpoint of the father. I've thought about it from the standpoint of the prodigal. Maybe I should take a look at it at the standpoint of the elder son. And we're certainly going to do that in just a, mo a moment. But when we put ourselves in the position of this father, and sometimes you just can't because you don't know what it's like to be a father or to be a parent. And so it's just hard for you to understand what would cause a man or a woman to love their children so much that they would just wait anxiously day after day to see why or if they're going to come back to just hope that they're doing okay. You know, Miss Betty a few weeks ago was so excited to raise her hand to give a testimony that after two years she had finally heard from her son that she found out, number one, that he was alive, that he was safe, was excited to find out that he was back in church and wanted to speak to her and she was just excited. If you've never been in that position, it is hard sometimes to understand but just think about it. What would it be like to be in the position of that father? What would it be like, first of all, to have your child come to you and say, listen, you know, things certainly are nice around here but I want to go off and I want to do things on my own. Can I tell you this and I'm going to ask my family to close their ears for just a moment. You know, uh, I, when my son Ryan left the house, and I mean when he literally moved out on his own, it's a time that you know it's going to happen. You know, if you're a parent, you know that one of these days, your children, they're going to move out. They're going to go. They're going to get married. They're going to start their own life. And, and, and he was doing this. And it just so happened that it was on a day and he was moving his stuff out of our house and he had his friends come over and help him. So really he didn't need me for much of anything. And I was standing upstairs in my room and I was just doing my stuff. And I looked outside, I saw the truck there, I saw him putting stuff in the truck. And I knew what was going to happen and I just couldn't help it. I just, I just broke down and weaved like a baby because my boy was leaving the house. Did I begrudge him that? Absolutely not. There was a day where I did the same thing. There was a day where you did the same thing. I absolutely did not begrudge him, but I knew that life was going to be different around the Davis household when he moved out. And it's funny. When you live together, you can go over the course of maybe two weeks and not even speak to each other in the same house. You're so busy, you pass, but just knowing that somebody's in the other room if you want to talk to them means a lot. And this father wasn't going to be able to talk and fellowship with his son anymore. Forget about the money. I know a lot of people pay attention to the money. You know that he divided his living and he went out and he wasted it. And people get hung up on the, the mess that this boy made of his life. Well, just if, you, if you're here and you've never made a mess of your life, you are living an amazing life. If you've never made any mistakes that you would look at and say, boy, I sure am sorry I did that. You are living a blessed choice life. And I'm telling you, that father could care less about that money. He was concerned about his boy. He was concerned about the fellowship. One time we did a study in this very Sunday school class and we studied the Father and we said some things about the Father. We said that He had made a stand for His family. We said that He had made a stand against the world and I think that's obvious when you look at uh, the way He lived His life. We said that uh, He had a sense of fairness about Him. We said that He uh, had certainly had love and compassion and, and that he, uh, uh, he had no problem forgiving somebody. We said that he appreciated what he had. That he was a well-balanced father and had a way of putting things in perspective. And for him, the heartbreak of not having his father around. And until you experience it, maybe you don't understand how that somebody would talk about something like this and couldn't get through it without weeping and sharing some tears. But you put yourself in that father's shoes. And you look at it from that standpoint. And it doesn't just have to be a father and a son. 
It can be a mother and a daughter, a father and a daughter, a mother and a son. It doesn't matter. There's a parent involved. There's a child involved. We love them. We care about them. We want to be involved. We don't want to see them make mistakes. We want to certainly keep that relationship as close as we can. And every day after he had divided up his living and that young man took off on his own journey, every day, He just waited for the day that he'd look out there and he'd see that old boy coming back home. Are you with me? And then we skip down here and we look at this very verse where it says that he arose and came to his father, but when he was a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion and ran. Sometimes we can be stubborn. And boy, if somebody's going to come back, they have to come back groveling and making a fool out of themselves and everything like that. We don't just go ahead and readily accept them and celebrate the fact that they're returned. Last night we were praying for folks who hadn't been in church in a while. Certainly we ought to pray for those kind of people. Have you ever looked at this from the standpoint that the father would be the pastor of the church? And that the prodigal would be that church member that just goes off and decides they're going to live their life the way that they see fit. And every Sunday morning, the pastor comes in and he just looks out there and says, huh, wonder if the day is going to be the day where that car pulls up the driveway again. Comes in on Sunday night and just wonders, is this going to be the night that so-and-so comes back in and really gets hooked up again? Every Wednesday night he gets down and he bows and he prays from a broken heart. Lord, would you take care of this church member that's out in the world on their own? Then one day, the door opens. And here comes that person. And oh, the pastor's heart, it just lights up like a Christmas tree and he can't get back there fast enough to shake that hand and say, hey, good to see you again. I'm glad you're back in the house of God. We've missed you. His heart was broken. But now because the prodigal came back, he had a reason to rejoice. And you know, in both scenarios, we can look at this situation and we can say, God had a hand in this thing. See, God was the one that brought back the remembrance of the Father's house to this prodigal. And no matter where our church members are that's out there in the world, and no matter what they're doing and what they're going through, the Lord is already arranging a face-to-face -face confrontation where He lets them know that they're out of His will and that they need to get back in the house of God. And what a blessing whenever you can be on the back end of this scenario. And when you can look back, and they always tell me that hindsight is 20 20 huh? And you can see how everything went together and how everything transpired. And this is a seamless story right here. This is a seamless account. You can get everything that happened and you can see how everything worked together to end up where we are at the end of the chapter. And you can say, you know what? God sure is good. And He is. So we certainly can identify with the Father. But then we look at the prodigal. And I know that there are some that when you look at the prodigal, you uh, don't, want, don't really know what it means necessarily to be prodigal. You have grown up in church. You've been raised in church. When Sunday morning comes around, you just know you get up, you get in the car, and you go to church. You're faithful to services. You do everything that you possibly uh, can do. And you just know that's what you do. You've never strayed from church. You've never strayed from the Lord. And for that, I'm very thankful that there are people like that. And I understand that there are people like that. But for every one person like that, there are many that are prodigal. And you know, when you put yourself in the shoes of this prodigal, whether you can identify with them from your own life, or whether you just have to look and get it from somebody else's standpoint. You know, the Bible says that the, the things that were written in the Old Testament they were written for our examples. That we might be able to look at them, to study them, and to learn some things from people's past mistakes. How God dealt with them, how He interacted with them, how He handled the situation, and then realize that if we go through the same type of situation, God's no respecter of persons. He's going to deal with us in a similar manner. So we look at it from the standpoint of the prodigal son. 
And uh, I know Brother Gerald every once in a while likes to give a testimony about that prodigal son and about the forgiveness of the father. And certainly, if you've ever been a prodigal son, it's a blessing, number one, to know that you had a father who was waiting for you the entire time. Number two... You look back at that moment when you were full of yourself and you looked out there and saw that the grass was greener on the other side. You know what happens when you get on the other side of the fence? It's not as green as you thought it was. It never is. Matter of fact, when you get on the, when you get on the other side of the fence for a while, you start looking back at where you were before, Melissa, and you said, you know what, it looks pretty good over there. Isn't that what this prodigal son did? He got out there in the, in the hog pen. He said, you know what? Looking across the fence on the other side, it doesn't look like I had it that bad. I mean, I had a good father. He took care of us. We had everything that we needed. But no, I had to get out on my own. And you know what? One of, the, one of the things that really, when I start to think about my past, that pains me is for the time that I got out of the will of God. What could have happened during that time frame had I not got out of the will of God? What what could He have done in my life? What could He have used me for in the life of others? And I'll be honest with you, if you continue to think along those lines, it can really get you down. But there's absolutely nothing you can do about the past. And one thing I see about this prodigal James is that he is in a place where he is willing to put his pride behind him. You know, he's willing to just put it behind him and at all costs. He's willing to even to humble himself to be a servant back at the house of God. And then when he gets down there and he finds that that father won't even entertain the thought that he'd be a servant, but he's going to come back in as a son. He's going to be restored with everything that he had before that he loved him now just as much as he did then. Boy, that's a blessing right there. That's exciting right there. You know, if you've ever been a church member, a prodigal church member, one of the things that you always think about is what's going to be said the first time you walk back into the church. The first time you see the pastor and you shake his hand again, what's going to be said? What are they going to be thinking? And you know, it's such a blessing to show up at a place where you get that warm extended handshake, you get that big smile, you get that big hug, and people are just happy to see you the same way that they were when you were there before. Yes, they missed you, but boy, they're glad to have you back. I think we can all identify a little bit with that prodigal, either because we ourselves have been prodigal or because we've seen it in somebody else. The elder son is an interesting uh, vantage point to look at this scenario from. And I don't know if there's many of us that would even admit to this, but I believe that we all have been where the elder son has been at some point in time. Where it seems like that we think that we're getting taken advantage of. I've always been here. I've always been faithful. I've been doing all the work. And here shows up my little brother and he's just going to take over again and we're all going to pay attention to him. And, and, and here I've been here all... And just get those feeling sorry for yourself. You know, in a church, the Bible is very clear that we are fitly framed together. Amen. Are you with me? That car that you drove up here in is made up of a lot of parts. And every one of those parts are important. Now I realize some of them are just for visibility's sake. I know that you get those nice wheels. You could get an old steel wheel if you wanted to, but you want those chrome wheels because chrome wheels look better. I understand that. But I still know this, that every part on the car plays a role. And we know you can't do without an engine. It just won't go anywhere. You can have the best engine in the world and not have a transmission and you're not going to move. How about this? You have the best engine, you have the best transmission, but boy, if there's just one of those little rubber hoses that decides it's going to leak fluid out, you are going to be in a mess in a hurry. True story. We had a car come in the other day down at the shop. And some of you that know anything about cars, you know that some of them have transmission coolers 
and in some of them the cooler lines run through the radiator. That means that there is antifreeze cooling the transmission fluid in those lines. The two are never supposed to mix. They're never supposed to you know, get into the other system. But we had one the other day where one of those lines inside the radiator ruptured and it allowed transmission fluid to get into where the antifreeze was supposed to be. And it allowed the antifreeze to get into the place where the transmission fluid is supposed to be. And if you know anything about cars, you know that that car is going to stop going somewhere in a hurry. It's going to overheat. It's going to set all kinds of trouble codes. The transmission is going to stop pulling because antifreeze is not supposed to be there. Transmission fluid is not supposed to be where the coolant is. There's going to be a mess. And lo and behold, there was a mess. In a church, you can't... We can't do without you. And really, you can't muscle your way into some place you shouldn't be because if you do either one of those things, it's going to cause a mess. Does that make sense? This morning, we need everybody. This morning, you are here. You have a role to play. You are important. Whether you're the prayer warrior, whether you're the pastor, whether you're the piano player, no matter what it is, your role is important. And you're needed. And you're fitly framed together. Now, you know what that means? That means there's no big I. There's no little you. That means God loves us all the same. If we're doing what we're supposed to do and we're up, you know, up keeping our end of the bargain, God is equally pleased with all of us. Those of you that stayed home this morning and prayed for the jail services, the Lord smiles upon that the same way if you were one of the ones that went over and participated in the jail services. There's no preference in His eyes. He loves everyone the same. He, he thinks everyone has a role to play. And we need to make sure we do that. But in the church house, I find oftentimes that people pay more attention to what other folks are doing than what they're doing. And really, this elder son kind of is like that. He is concerned about all the attention that is being given unto this prodigal son. And what he didn't stop to think is that every day of his life, he was there to share in his father's love. He always had his father there to turn to in time of need. If he didn't know what to do, if he needed some advice, all he had to do was walk down the hallway and say, Hey, Dad, can you help me? But this prodigal had been out there on his own. Now, he didn't have that kind of help. He didn't have that kind of stability and security. And now he was home and people were celebrating that fact, but he was paying attention more to himself. Why didn't anybody celebrate for me? Why anybody having a party for me? I always stayed here. I never went anywhere. Boy, the father sure didn't know how to handle that situation. And he sure did diffuse it in a pretty quick and efficient manner. And you know what? Our father could as well if we'd focus our eyes upon him. If we would just let him show us what he has in store for us. And show us how important that that is. Everything that God calls upon us to do, it is important. It is life and death. And if we would just realize that and focus our attention on what He says for us to do and how important it is, we would pray for our brothers and sisters. We would pray that they're in, the, in God's will. We would pray that they're doing everything that they were doing. But we wouldn't get disgruntled if we saw them having some fruit. You know, if we saw them, uh, uh, you know, maybe uh, getting a pat on the back, if you will, sometimes people need pats on the back. Sometimes people need fruit. Sometimes people need to be uplifted a little bit. And lo and behold, the Lord's no respecter of persons. When you need it the most, He'll be there for you as well. When you need a party, when you need a celebration, when you need a fatted calf to be killed, He'll be there for you. He has an abundance. He's not going to run out. You know, this wasn't the last fatted calf on the farm. Are you with me? There were more out there if there needed to be another celebration. The father's love was not exhausted because he was showing his, his younger boy how much he loved him. He still had plenty of love for the older child. But boy, he sure was happy that that youngin' was back at the house. The elder son. But now think about this, okay? 
I told you, you can really get crazy and you could look at it from the outside and you could look at it from the people who were viewing the family friends and stuff like that. You could look at it from the vantage point of the person who had hired on this young man uh, to take care of the swine. And maybe you want to go home and do that. That's fine. But there's two other thoughts that the Lord laid on my heart that since we're rinsing and repeating, we're trying to uh, you know, build on what we've learned before out of this particular passage. There are two other things that the Lord laid on my heart. For instance, no matter where you are in this story, whether you're the father, whether you're the prodigal son, whether you're the elder son, or whether you're one of those ones that are just looking on, you have to realize how that your particular position affects the others that are involved. Does that make sense to you? The Father, see all this worked, and the Father was really the one that held all this together. But His strength, and His love and His compassion and the way that He handled Himself was important to the elder son, was important to the prodigal son. The prodigal son had such confidence that he could go back there and, and trust that his father would at least give him some food and, and give him a job. But he got way more than that. And when you're in the position of the Father, you need to look at this scenario and you need to realize how important that your role is and how it affects the others that are in play. That prodigal son made some mistakes. That prodigal son, not real proud of where they're at right now. That father and how he reacts can make or break that situation. You have to realize how that your position affects those around you. And not just in this scenario, because you could go through all of them and you could say, okay, if I was the prodigal, how am I affecting the other people involved? Well, number one, I'm making my brother have to do twice as much work, am I not? If I'm not there to hold up my end of the bargain, who's going to do what I used to do? That somebody else has to do that. So because I'm out doing things on my own, I'm trying to live life on, on, on my terms, I am putting more of a hindrance, I'm putting more of a load on my brother. And then I have to think, how have I affected my father in all of this? My father's back at the house, he's heartbroken, he misses me, he's waiting for me. I went out and I've wasted his substance. You see, when you start looking at it from all these different vantage points, number one, it starts to help you, does it not? It starts to help you learn some things, but it just makes this story get bigger and bigger and bigger. It's amazing. When I first surrendered to pastor the church down in Dry Ridge, I thought to myself, okay, I'm going to go from preaching, you know, two or three times every couple of weeks to I'm going to be having three services in Sunday school every week. Four lessons slash messages I'm going to have to come up with. Number one, I was glad I had a big book <laughs> to get the messages out of. I'm glad that I had a God that was going to give me the messages and I didn't have to worry about it a whole lot. But do you know what? When you get into this big old Bible and, and boy, the first time you start to read it, you think that it's humongous. It intimidates you because you think you're never going to get done with it. But you know what? Whenever you get in there and you begin to study it, it just kind of all fits together. And when you start reading the New Testament and you put the Gospels together with what happened in the book of Acts and you see how uh, the book of Acts is a transition book to bring us from the Old Testament to the New Testament, you see how the epistles work together to show us how that we should act and how we should conduct ourselves in the church and everything just comes together the book also gets smaller and you can understand it when we do our studies the idea is that we first make it big so that there's a lot there that we can glean from it but then the idea is that we study it and we get what God wants us to have and then it begins to close up and get back into that nice neat package again where we have literally looked at it and we've learned what God would have us to learn from it and it all fits together and it's back in that nice neat package until guess what? Until it's time to rinse and repeat again. Rinse and repeat. I would, uh, I would dare say that even if we tried to guess what scripture that Brother Doug was going to be preaching out of this morning, it would be pretty difficult to do that. 
somebody might get close. Boy, there's an outside chance that somebody could guess the very scripture that he was going to use. But for the most part, we have no idea what he's going to say. Unless Jordan somehow broke into his study and got his notes, and even then we don't know Jordan because the Lord might change his, <laughs> Lord might change his mind. Right? But I can tell you this. And I made this statement a couple weeks ago, and every once in a while the Lord makes me look really good. And I said that the Sunday school hour was just to prepare us for what was coming. I said, but the real message is coming in the Sunday morning hour. And boy, <laughs> we were not disappointed. God gave Brother Doug exactly what we needed. He preached it the way that we needed to hear it. And man, I tell you what, people got help. I know this. Whatever he says to turn to this morning, we need to hear it. It may be something we've never heard of before. It may be one of those obscure stories in the Bible that you just don't see preached on very much. If so, what an opportunity to learn from something new. But you know what? If he preaches on Jonah, and we have to hear about somebody getting thrown in the belly of the whale again, and getting vomited out, we have an opportunity to look at it from a different way. Now what I teach is mainly, when you're at home in your Bible study, this is what you ought to do, and this is how you ought to take a different look at things. That's, that's what I try to help you with. But you know, you've got to study in order to put these things into practice. And when you study, if you put them into practice, I promise you, you will get, you'll get help from it. You'll start seeing things in a different way. You'll start seeing things get bigger. And you put yourself in other people's positions. And you think about what they have to do. I hear preachers say it all the time that they don't know what has transpired in all of our lives during the week just so that we can come to church on Sunday, worship the Lord, and put an offering in the offer plate. But when you begin to put yourself in other people's shoes, it's a whole lot easier to understand sometimes why they do what they do. And it's a whole lot easier to love them and have compassion on them. I appreciate your time this morning.